to Chatham House. Uh, delighted uh, that you are able to be with us today for, uh, as what you can see is going to be a conversation, um, uh, rather than, there's no lectern here, a conversation with His Royal Highness Prince Turkey bin Faisal um, Al Saud. Um, uh, Prince Turkey, welcome back to Chatham House. I know you've been here on a number of occasions, but mostly for uh, round tables that we've had the pleasure of doing with you, most especially in your capacity as uh, chairman of the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies, um, with whom our colleagues in our Middle East and North Africa program have had the opportunity of, uh, of undertaking a number of studies. Um, Prince Turkey, uh, as many of you know, one of the, I think, best informed um, uh, members of the Saudi royal family, somebody who's played a very important role in their international relations, in their external affairs, uh, having served for many years as the Director General of the General Intelligence Directorate in Saudi Arabia, but then also as ambassador here in the United Kingdom um, uh, from 2002 to 2005, and then ambassador to Washington from 2005 to 2007, at a particularly uh, intense time, I think it would be fair to say, in international relations around that period. Um, and uh, what we're going to do today is, as I said, have a, uh, a conversation uh, rather than speeches. Um, this is perhaps self-evidently on the record, just to remind you, uh, Prince Turkey, uh, although at Chatham House this is on the record, we are also actually live streaming this uh, conversation to our members who are, uh, uh, and guests who are not uh, with us here today. Um, we'll uh, start off by having uh, a discussion and then we will uh, open it up and uh, get some thoughts and questions uh, from our members uh, and guests here within uh, Chatham House itself, within the room. And so, um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank let, you very much. Let me start um, with perhaps the most obvious point to start with, given that your visit has now coincided with what people are saying um, uh, was an unexpected result in the Israeli elections. Um, and uh, an election which ended up with Prime Minister Netanyahu in the closing moments, really, almost, of the election, explicitly making um, a commitment that during his premiership, under the current circumstances, there would not be a Palestinian state. Um, the Arab Peace Initiative, which you and others had helped develop, uh, and which was sort of coming back into the frame to a certain extent, now looks like it has been put uh, back on ice. Could I just start with you on this question? Do you think the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is therefore going to remain a festering wound in the region uh, for all the communities uh, involved there? Or do you think it becomes immediately more dangerous in what is already a very dangerous region? Uh, we've been living with this for a long time, but is this something that now you worry as you know the region, think about it, could trigger a more dangerous context? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. First of all, thank you very much for hosting me. I see many familiar faces here, and it's good that they're all in one place, and I can say hello <laughs> to all of them. And uh, thank you for being here. Um, I don't think Mr. Netanyahu really changed much by his statement, because ever since he's been prime minister, he's resisted the idea of a Palestinian state coming into being. And he maneuvered and politicized and uh, criticized and, and did all sorts of uh, dealings and wheelings to prevent the um, uh, statehood coming to the Palestinians. So uh, his coming out and saying it is not something that I find surprising, uh, especially in the election and as a means of, as they were saying in, in the media today, of galvanizing his base, which is basically a very right-wing Israeli uh, uh, Part of, the, of the, part of the Israeli public. Uh, whether it is uh, more dangerous or, or not, I think it continues to be a very dangerous uh, development. Uh, I don't think the we can say that it is more dangerous than his actions previously because his actions previously were very dangerous, and denying the Palestinians uh, the right to self-determination and all that comes with that. It was a dangerous prospect, and I think on both sides, the extremists now are taking advantage of this. And on, I think on the Arab side, the extremists are very happy that Mr. 
Netanyahu has come out the way that he has, because now they can turn to the rest of us and say, you see, we told you. He is not serious. Israel is not going to give up anything and is going to continue the settlement policy. And um, therefore, we have been justified all this time not to come into the peace process. And on the Israeli side, of course, I'm sure the, the, the uh, settlers and all the other uh, extreme right-wingers are also extremely happy because it shows that from their point of view, they're equally justified in what they have been doing uh, in, uh, in the past. So, so the danger is there, it's going to continue, and it's going to reflect on all of us, not just the Palestinians. Um, we could do a whole conversation on that part, but I think what I should do is move around topics maybe a little bit at the moment and, and, and let us come back and let uh, our guests and other uh, members ask questions later on. Let me just take you quickly to the other key topic uh, on the agenda at the moment in the region, which is uh, the push imminently, potentially, or in the coming months or weeks, to achieve uh, a deal on Iran's nuclear program. And I know you've been public uh, in your statements about your and the Saudi government's concerns about the nature of the deal that you believe is going to emerge, one that would permit enrichment of nuclear material in Iran. And I think you've said uh, explicitly that you feel this will be destabilizing because it will kick off uh, some type of uh, competitive uh, race within the region. Maybe you could say a word or two about that. But also, if I may ask Prince Turkey, um, what's the alternative? What, what are you, your colleagues in Saudi Arabia, others who, who maybe agree with you, what are you proposing that would be different? What would you be doing if you were sitting in uh, Barack Obama's uh, seat uh, uh, and pushing it on this topic of the Iranian nuclear program? The, uh, the Americans and, and, the, and the Iranians have been flirting with each other. Um, and Mr. Obama started the flirting in his first campaign back in 2008. If you look back on it, you remember he said we want to get this Iran issue off the table. And he's been very consistent in that. Mm. In 2009, when the so-called Green Revolution took place in Iran, he didn't bat an eyelid, yani, either in expressing support or of, the, of the revolutionaries or criticism of the of the way that they were handled by, by the Iranian government. And it continued. I must say, and during the interim, of course, he ratcheted up the, the, the sanctions against Iran very successfully with the other members of the Security Council to put more pressure on Iran, which he has achieved. But now it seems that each side is so anxious to get over the flirtation and to go towards the consummation <laughs> that um, we're going to have a deal. And how good or how bad it is, I don't know, because we haven't seen the details of that. But from my view, there is an alternative. Okay. And there has been an alternative on the table since 1974, presented ironically by Iran to the United Nations in the form of then a zone free of nuclear weapons. That proposition is still on the table. Now it's become a zone free of weapons of mass destruction. And since 1995, mm -hmm. that proposition has been at the United Nations, represented by then President Mubarak uh, at the General Assembly meeting that year. And two years ago, or three years ago, five years ago, 2010, the MPT review conference um, agreed to hold a, uh, um, a session on the zone free of weapons of mass destruction in Helsinki in, in Finland yep. um, in 2012. Uh, unfortunately, just uh, a couple of weeks before that uh, session was supposed to be held, one of the conveners, the United States, declared that there wasn't enough um, uh, agreement in advance to make the, the session successful and therefore there is not going to be a session. And since then, since that date, 2012, um, the, there have been several meetings under the auspices of the United Nations or 
to please the Israelis under other auspices because they refused to come under the auspices of the United Nations. And uh, uh, those sessions uh, sometimes included Israel but not Iran, other times included Iran but not Israel. And so we've been going around in circles, presumably to find a way to hold that um, uh, aborted attempt in 2012 before the next review conference, which is coming up next month yeah. at the United Nations for the MPT signatories. And that, from my point of view, that is the best way to go about ensuring that there is no um, uh, proliferation of the dangerous um, process of enriching uranium. Mm -hmm. um, once you have that, you're going to have the rest of it, and, uh, eventually. And the way that we understand this agreement is going to be, the base is going to be a 10-year period hiatus for the Iranians. But then after that, it's anybody's guess uh, what's going to happen. And uh, that is going to incentivize not just people in, or countries in the area, but the whole world will be incentivized to compete for uranium enrichment. Mm -hmm. um, and I, as a layman, not as an expert, I would rather see a lid put on all of that now rather than wait 10 years from now when Iran presumably will have then the free, uh, freedom to go beyond the 5, 10, or 20 percent that they are given in this, uh, this agreement and shoot for, for a nuclear weapon. Are, are there um, security guarantees that the United States and allies could offer to a country like Saudi Arabia that would make it feel sufficiently secure for it not to be involved in enriching nuclear material for its own power and, uh, and other requirements, if Iran has that right? Or is it the case that Iran is able to enrich nuclear weapons and there's nothing that allies can do <coughs> that would make us feel secure? My preference for the zone is that it would be uh, a level playing field for everybody and not just Saudi Arabia or Iran. But the whole country, the whole area, and yani from Iran all the way across to the Atlantic, um, including the Arab countries, and maybe Turkey as well. Uh, so that is where I would rather see any guarantees coming to the area by yeah. having the zone established then, <coughs> and not just the United States, but the permanent five members of the Security Council would then offer a nuclear security umbrella to the zone, yeah. and not just to Saudi Arabia. That would be a better guarantee than any unilateral or any other formulation for a guarantee. Let me just keep moving on with a couple more topics and we'll, we'll uh, definitely open this up. Just staying with the United States for a minute, um, there certainly is the impression, and it has been written a lot about, and I think uh, colleagues from your part of the region have definitely commented on this, that they feel the United States has disengaged at some level from the Middle East. Maybe not entirely strategically, but that the, the choices that are made in how the United States engages are more selective. One could take Syria uh, as an example, that in a way the United States is tired of the persistent conflict in the Middle East. Um, and at the same time, the Arab uprisings that took place initially in Tunisia, Egypt, uh, Syria, um, drove a bit of a wedge between our traditional allies like Saudi Arabia that had seen the benefits of gradual reform and stability versus the United States that felt it went with where the majority of the population seemed to want to go. It, can this relationship be re... Can we put Humpty Dumpty back together again? Can the level of trust that existed prior to 2011, uh, maybe one could say prior to 2001, but certainly prior to 2011, be reconstituted in your opinion? It wasn't just Saudi officials and, and I or others who, who commented on the United States uh, lowering its, its, its engagement, if you like, in, uh, in our part of the world. American officials have said so, uh, including President uh, Obama, and we must take him at his word. I'm glad he didn't put it in red line terms, but uh, <laughs> that is something I think that we have to live with, and uh, there is no uh, other uh, solution for us. Uh, we continue to have excellent relations with the United States as envisioned and as seen by the various contacts that we've had 
our officials have had with, with President Obama. And he's, he's made a, a trip to the kingdom when uh, the late King Abdullah was still alive. Twice he visited Saudi Arabia, or maybe three times, I don't remember now. And he made a special effort to come to see King Salman when he succeeded King Abdullah. And I'm sure at that level of the relationship, you know, both uh, leaders have reached uh, an understanding of where they want to go uh, with, the, with the relationship. Sitting outside that, that circle of, of leadership discussions, the United States has a credibility gap, if you like. Mm. I remember when I was growing up in the 60s, uh, the election at that time between Kennedy and, and, and Nixon, there was the missile gap that was mm. supposed to exist and turned out that it wasn't, that it was really the opposite way the U.S. had superseded. So maybe I'm living under false, <laughs> false, uh, false uh, visions here, but there is a credibility gap for the United States and not just in the kingdom. Yeah, and I see that reflected everywhere. And that gap is going to take time uh, to overcome. Okay. And it, it needs action and not just words. And where would you like to see action? I'd like to see action in Syria, frankly. And I think it's not just the United States. I think the whole world community is criminally, criminally responsible for the death of more than 250,000 Syrians because of the way that they have treated with Bashar al-Assad and his regime that continues to kill uh, Syrians. Uh, yesterday in the news, I don't know if you've heard it or not, but chlorine gas is now used by him on civilians, not on fighters of Fahish or, um, you'll have to wait until I explain what Fahish yes. is, um, and, uh, and others in, in, in the field. And I think that is, uh, that is uh, unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And uh, action can be taken, and I proposed publicly before, that in Syria we need to have several things. First thing, we need to have no-fly zones mm -hmm. on the border with Turkey and on the border with Jordan. Secondly, the coalition council that more than 130 countries recognize as being representative of the Syrian people should move to Syrian territory under protection of the no-fly zone and act as a Syrian government in Syrian territory. And thirdly, we should offer the best support for the free Syrian army. Many of you here probably and others discount that there is any efficacy in, in that. I would disagree mm -hmm. because in my view, the Syrian people in general are opposed as much to Assad as they are opposed to Fahish and the Nusra and the other groups there. And if they saw any sign of support for the Free Syrian Army, they would galvanize their efforts and support the Free Syrian Army. But all of these things, of course, are up to the decision makers to make, and I see no way that they can be convinced, unfortunately. I mean, you, you said that most people are against uh, Assad, or at least wouldn't it be the case that different people are against different groups? That, that in the end, uh, even Assad is potentially seen as a better protector of the interests of his community, as he might see it, and even some of the other minority communities in Syria, than any Free Syrian Army or any other group, even if they're moderate, could be. Well, if you look at the Syrian jails, and, and I haven't, but others have, there are as many Alawites in prisons in, in Syrian jails, as they are Sunnis, Christians, Druze, or, or whatever. So Assad has been very democratic in his operation. <laughs> um, and, and, and therefore, I don't think Assad yeah. re necessarily represents protection for, for certain minorities, definitely not the Alawites. And so uh, equally, Fahish and, and, and the other uh, groups that operate uh, in Syrian soil, the terrorists, they don't represent the, the, Syrian, the Syrian Sunni majority. And that's why I say that the majority of the people there would support uh, the Free Syrian Army, which still maintains its non-ethnic, non-sectarian non um, positions on all issues. This bring, brings me my last question, then I'm going to open it up for those of you who'd uh, like to ask questions. Um, Islamic State, Daesh, or as you call it, Fahesh, and I'll let you explain why you use that term mm -hmm. 
uh, in a minute, um, could that act as a uniting force, its appearance, its relative success across that borderland area between Iraq and Syria? Uh, you've got Iranians fighting against Daesh right now at the same time as you have coalition forces undertaking the same actions. Could it act as a unifying, maybe too strong a term, or at least a hatchet to burying uh, a catalyst that could open opportunities for greater regional coordination if they can be defeated? Could the emergence of Daesh have a, a bit of a positive outcome in the longer term, in your opinion? Let me explain first why I call it Fahish. Uh, many of you who know Arabic will know the word Fahish means obscene. And the Arabic uh, acronym for ISIS is Daesh. So I coined the word Fahish to describe Daesh because they're more applicable to them as the word Fahish than Daesh. Daesh in Arabic, of course, means Dawlat al-Islamiyya fil Iraq wa sham which means Islamic State in Iraq and, and, and Syria or Sham, and they're definitely not a state, they're definitely not Islamic, and they don't control Iraq and Sham. So uh, Fahish is a much better word for them, and I wish, I wish the media here, particularly the Arab media, and I see two or three prominent ones already in here, would use that word instead of continuing to give them what they so obviously want to get, which is recognition as being a state and as being Islamic. Um, on the issue whether uh, that they, they will galvanize, sure. And it, uh, we see already, I mean, in, in Syria we have a coalition um, of, of countries that are fighting Fahish uh, on the ground. Uh, in Iraq we have another coalition uh, fighting Fahish. But that's where the problem exists. Mm. Even in that galvanization of people around it, you find separate theaters of operation. Um, fighting the same enemy, and that is unacceptable. That disjointed uh, uh, military campaign is neither going to succeed in rooting out Fahish because Fahish is left to operate differently in different places. And uh, I'm guessing that you're talking about rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. That seems to be a very popular uh, <laughs> subject wherever I go and people ask me about it. Two things that will never change in our relationship with Iran. Geography. Mm. Unfortunately, we can't cut off the Arabian Peninsula and sail away and you know, lay anchor somewhere near Finland or near yes. Sweden. Or, I was wondering which neighbor you're going to uh, lay anchor next to, <laughs> Finland. <yeah. laughs> so we're stuck with geography. It's been thousands of years that we've been stuck with these people. Uh, the other one, of course, <laughs> The other one, and, and I'm serious about this, and I, I say it in the friendliest of, of, of terms, the other thing that, that keeps us together is our religion. We worship the same God, we follow the same holy book, we have the same prophet, and the history that has existed since uh, 1400 years uh, in the religion. Look at it, for God's sake. Iran is ruled by a man who claims Arab descent. Khamenei wears the black turban because he, 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 he believes that he is descended from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, this black turban yani, should be a means for us to be together rather than separating us. And, and from that context, yani, I would say that the kingdom has been trying year in and year out, um, even during the worst presidency that Iran had under Ahmadinejad to engage with Iran, on, not just on issues of interference in Arab affairs, but even on, on overcoming the, the Shia-Sunni divide. Um, in 2012, in, in Ramadan, the holiest of, of holy months in, in, in the Muslim calendar, the late King Abdullah called for an Islamic summit conference in the holy city of Mecca. And the subject of that conference was to overcome the Shia-Sunnah divide. And Ahmadinejad came, and all of the representatives of, of uh, Muslim countries attended, and they all agreed to set up a study group or a center for overcoming this, this, this divide to be established in the city of Medina in Saudi Arabia. Alas, since then, nothing has happened, despite the urging of, of Saudi Arabia. And other such 
indications of where Saudi Arabia has been. You all remember the, the Iraq support group that existed after the fall of Saddam Hussein. Who was it composed of? It was composed of the United Kingdom, the United States, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Egypt, Jordan, and at that time, even Syria was, was included. So this engagement with Iran has never been uh, a taboo subject for, for Saudi Arabia, and we're still trying. Mm -hmm. Our foreign minister met with their foreign minister in New York in last September, and I wasn't there, of course, but I can imagine that each side presented a list of complaints to the other about our conduct. And our minister renewed the invitation to Mr. Um, uh, Zarif to come to the kingdom to, to carry on the, uh, the, the discussions further. He hasn't arrived and hasn't done so since uh, his, President Rouhani was, was elected. And we, you heard at, at the conference in, in, in Amman that we attended together that the main issue holding Zarif from, from coming there was an issue of protocol. Mm -hmm. Because Zarif wants to come and meet with the king. Mm -hmm. And at the time of King Abdullah, of course, King Abdullah was ill and he couldn't meet him, so he didn't come. But if there was any serious intent on the part mm -hmm. of Mr. Zarif to engage in a, in a conversation that will re end, end up in results, he would have come. Mm -hmm. and he, pro these protocolish issues he's, are, I think, silly and, and, and significant. And he was going to be given you know, the highest accommodation available. And he's going to meet his, his counterpart. He's not going to be uh, ignored. He's not going to be insulted and put in a tent instead of the palace. Uh, things like that. And, uh, so issues of protocol uh, are, are silly to use as an excuse. But the kingdom is, is ready, willing, and able, and has said so publicly. Recently, Prince Saud, our foreign minister, in his, uh, in his uh, uh, press conference with Mr. Kerry just two weeks ago, mentioned that if Iran was a constructive player in the area, we'll be more than happy to, to coordinate with them. But they have to be a negative player. They have to, to stop being a negative player. And that is where it stops. Well, as we've discovered, there are domestic politics in, in Iran as well as in the United States and Israel and everywhere else. So uh, I imagine there's, there's an element of, of that going on in terms of the decisions they can take. But we'll come in, I think, in a minute to some of the issues at the core of the problems between Iran uh, and Saudi Arabia from Yemen. You already mentioned Syria, but Iraq with uh, the... Uh, Revolutionary Guard playing an increasingly active role, including in the retaking of Tikrit and, and so on. So there's plenty to talk about. I know I've put a few questions out there, but I'm sure I haven't even touched the surface of, of the issues we'd like to do. So let me bro bring some questions in from our colleagues here, and I'll take uh, hands that I've seen them go up. First, the gentleman there. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. 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 Your Excellency Jonathan Paris, member of the Institute and... Uh, Microphone, again. Yeah, just keep it nice and close oh. to you, yeah. yeah. Your Excellency Jonathan Paris, member of Chatham yes. House and a Middle East analyst. I'd like to follow up on Robin's allusion to Yemen and, and get your views on what needs to be done about Yemen. You want That's to a nice simple question. I think, I think we'll take them one at okay. a time, because if something as specific as that, it's best okay. to do it, and I'll group them a little bit at the end. Okay. Yemen is... Uh, will require its own answer, I think. So I'll let you take that one first. Yemen, there is, there is a, um, a, uh, a roadmap to resolve the, the uh, instability and, and problems in Yemen, which was uh, uh, approved uh, by the United Nations Security Council uh, a couple of years ago, and which called for an interim government that would then set up the, the stage for a, a more permanent uh, um, constitutional and uh, institutional building um, resolution of Yemen's uh, problems. Um, that um, roadmap, alas, was, was interdicted and interrupted mm. by uh, one of the parties involved in Yemen, called the Houthis, um, with full support from Iran, by the way, uh, which literally just simply took over the capital and uh, for a time um, imprisoned the president, the prime minister, and many of the ministers who were in Sana'a at the time. Uh, for them, uh, it was an issue of, uh, of 
taking over. Uh, and that was plain and simple. And they had, unfortunately, help, very strong help from the ex-president, who had been replaced through this roadmap that uh, the GCC had proposed and that was supported by the Security Council. Um, since that, that time, uh, the, the president escaped from their clutches and, and moved to the, to the other capital of Yemen uh, in Aden. Uh, as have now many of the ministers, and just I think yesterday or the day before, finally the Houthis uh, released the prime minister. Um, and uh, the president in Aden, who is legitimate, who is recognized by the United Nations Security Council and by all other countries in, in, in the area and in the world, except for Iran, um, has called for uh, the reconciliation talks that were continuing in Sana'a uh, to take place in the GCC headquarters in, um, in Riyadh. Um, many parties in the political frame of, of, uh, of Yemen have supported his call, except for the Houthis mm. and the supporters of the ex-president. Uh, they haven't done so. But I think the, 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 the meeting is probably going to go on. And I think that's where we can see somehow um, a way forward uh, on the Yemen. The kingdom and other countries, including the Security Council, support the, uh, the, uh, the President uh, Hadi, who is the legitimate uh, president there, and want him uh, success. And in order to do that, I think we have to be ready to do whatever is necessary, not only to support him financially, but to be able to politically and even militarily give him the support that he would need to face any party that would stand in the way of the reconciliation. Uh, the back first, yeah. Hi, hello, it's Martin Ratz. I'm with Morgan Stanley. Um, we um, just met, didn't we? We did. We That's just did. Might be a different yeah. question. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> So the question is inevitably about oil. Um, I might be uh, at risk of pushing the boundaries of the conversation a little bit, but it's very diff difficult to disconnect the Middle East from oil. Um, if you produce 10 million barrels a day, like Saudi Arabia does, the difference between $100 oil and $50 oil is about half a billion dollars in revenue per day. And as a Russian government official once said, a billion here, a billion there, before you know it, you're talking real money. Um, <laughs> for most countries, that would have fairly sizable impact, but of course, Saudi Arabia is not any country. Um, still, I wanted to ask you, from where you are sitting, um, are you already starting to notice some impact of this? Um, if not, what would you expect the impact of this to be over the medium term? Um, and finally, is there a point at which it becomes sensible for Saudi Arabia to become, once again, a more active sort of manager of oil markets? Thank you. First of all, I would say that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the decline in prices affects everybody. Mm. Uh, and I'm sure in the whole uh, world, people are looking at what are the alternatives and what are the means of overcoming this, this precipitous decline from $100 now to less than, than $50. And, and many of us are welcoming it. Well, uh, and let me, let me just continue on that. <laughs> Um, so it's not just Saudi Arabia that, that is thinking about where to go from here. And I would simply add that I am not an oil expert, but I do read and I do discuss with people who give me opinions, as I discussed with you earlier on the, the position of oil companies now. Um, I think producers of, of shale oil, for example, are equally facing a tough question for them. Are they going to invest more in that or is this decline in, in oil, oil prices a more uh, or a longer term uh, uh, issue than, than they had envisioned? Um, and other such uh, considerations. The kingdom has already taken steps um, within the kingdom uh, to meet this, uh, this challenge uh, that we have. Uh, first of all, the step the first step that we took is that we're going to undertake whatever obligations we made, the government made, to the people on the issue of projects and, and social and, and other services that are provided to the people. That is not going to change. But there is a, now a new higher council 
for economy and development in Saudi Arabia. And they are looking at all of the various alternatives that the kingdom may have on, on budget spending, uh, on budget allocation, on prioritizing uh, uh, projects, and so on. Because even if we have the wish that this situation will, got, will be gotten over quickly, it might take a longer time. Uh, but I don't think the kingdom will soon uh, interfere in, in, in the oil market. Uh, we learned our lesson a long time ago that when you try to do that, uh, you get burned. Uh, and uh, the oil market will, will fix itself. Uh, uh, because there are so many players in the oil market that one country by itself is not going to fix it. One group of countries, OPEC, is not going to fix it. And as you've seen, Yanni, not just Russia, but even the other OPEC members, went along with the decision that was taken last year by, by OPEC to continue um, production quotas for, for the countries. Uh, so the kingdom will continue on that, on that line. Okay, question at the front first. Yeah. No, here first. Microphone's coming. Yeah. Microphone's coming. Yeah. John Wilson, a member of uh, Rusi, uh, Rusi, yes, and Chatham House. I'm oh, good. A journalist. Equal uh, opportunity. Further to uh, what you said, Your Royal Highness, uh, do you agree that the fundamental problems in the Middle East are not religious but economic based on the rapid rise of populations? No. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that, that the, the, the problems in the Middle East rise out of politics. Politics? Yes. And uh, definitely, um, whether internally or externally, the, the, the political attitudes and actions of countries are the driving force in that. Uh, I look at Saudi Arabia as an example. The youth bulge that is described by many as being a potential threat to the kingdom, I see it as an asset because it, it gives us a fairly young population that have been hopefully uh, better educated than my generation, and uh, uh, that will come to, to the fore in the near future and take over from fuddy duddies like me, uh, who haven't done too well for them uh, in, in what we've, we're leaving them, uh, but hopefully who can take on the challenges that face uh, not only Saudi Arabia, but other countries in, uh, in, in the area. And I know there are questions about, for example, this uh, diminishing resources, etc. But that, is, that has never stopped anybody in the past from finding alternatives. And I think the, the young people are our biggest asset in being more imaginative, perhaps, more dynamic, definitely, and even more ambitious, if you like, in where they want to go in, in the future. As long as they have opportunity to go for where they want to go, that is the main factor, I think, that will affect youth in Saudi Arabia. Um, and the politics in the area, if you look at the colonization, post-colonization, Arab socialism, Islamic revival, all of that, most of it has been driven by politics and not by religion. That is my, my perception. Even the so-called Sunni-Shia divide, it was the politics of Ayatollah Khomeini in taking over power in Iran that drove him to emphasize the Shia specter or the Shia um, uh, color of, uh, of Iran. And uh, on the opposite side, those who, who, who have come up to oppose the Iranian um, influence and, and their growing interference in, in, in the area are doing so because of politics, not because they are adherents to the Sunni um, sect or to any particular um, uh, subdivision of Islam thereof. Uh, and that is why I say that it is really more the politics rather than the religion and or, uh, or the youth. Yeah. And just pretty quick, the, the probably apply to a lot of the Gulf countries. If you look across the Arab world and certainly to North Africa, a very populous part of the world, 
where poverty is more broadly spread, where the Arab uprisings at least started. Would you say there's a differentiation between maybe dominance of politics in the Gulf region, but economic opportunity, you'd say, is also not a factor in, or not as important a factor in North Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean? North Africa has many political problems. If you look at countries like Algeria, for example, economically speaking, they should be much better off than, than they are. And I'm sure they're trying to be that as well. Libya had huge economic uh, resources. Uh, Tunis was one of the poorer countries, Morocco less wealthy than, than the others, but it was the, dif the political differences, for example, between Algeria and Morocco are the things that are preventing the establishment of a regional organization uh, and the model of the GCC. But what about internal politics capturing the economies? Would you also reference that type of politics as being a problem? I would say that the politics is the one that drives the, the economic issue. Yeah, but it could be internal, not simply and between and countries. Even, and even internal. And I think... Algeria is a case in point. And no. It is the politics of the situation that allows Mr. Mr. Bouteflika mm -hmm. to remain in power uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Algeria. And he's been a very deft ruler uh, from, that, uh, from that context. Um, it was the politics in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Libya mm -hmm. that led to the downfall of Muammar al-Qaddafi. And today it is the politics in Libya that is keeping Libya from coming together and uh, overcoming their, their, their differences. Maybe keep going. First, uh, gentleman there, and I'll come to you after. Yeah. Of course, you, madam. Yeah. Uh, Ronan Tynan. Um, thank you, Prince Turkey, for your comments about uh, the Israeli election, which certainly chimed with my own feelings. But I just want to ask you about something John Kerry said late last year when he, specula when he said spontaneously uh, during a visit to the region trying to generate support for ISIS, he found that leaders asked him to do something or to urge a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian uh, situation. And I put it to you that the election, as you rightly said, Netanyahu appears to be a very dangerous development given his unequivocal commitment uh, to absolutely never uh, succumbing to the idea of a, a Palestinian state. You know, surely it's time for urgent action. And I want to ask you in that context, do you have any ideas as to how that could be pressed forward uh, given the context we're now in, because it is an issue that seems to come up from time to time and become an all-encompassing issue with considerable potential to damage, not just the Middle East, as you said, but all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, on, on this issue, I mean, I know you addressed it a little earlier on, but right. is there something else we say what could be done at this point this time? Well, I think immediately I mean, the Palestinian Authority should go to the International Criminal Court and present their case against Israel. Um, and that will definitely stir the pot, if you like. And, and, and hopefully, if, if America is so convinced of its position that there is going to be a two-state solution, then they will have to do something uh, to meet that challenge in, 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 in the International cr uh, Criminal Court. Um, otherwise, I don't know, Yanni. You tell me. Uh, <laughs> what do you want us to do, Yanni? And, and, uh, We've done everything. I mean, the Arab peace plan is on the table, and uh, we're supporting Mahmoud Abbas's position on renegotiations. Just yesterday, I think he reiterated the fact that after elections, he will hope to start renegotiating with the, with the Israelis. So that's where it stands. Let me group questions in twos now, because it yes, was happening. Lots of hands are going up later. Um, so first here and here, and then I've got lots of other hands. Yeah, please. Uh, Ziad Idris, um, member of Chatham House and investment manager. Um, Where are you from, sir? Asli Iraqi. Okay. Okay. Um, Iraqi originally. Um, the the question the question for you is um, you you said something, uh, Your Highness, that I I really like that America should take more action on Syria and on the region uh, in general. But isn't isn't the real issue that Saudi Arabia and its Arab allies are not taking enough action themselves in the region? We talk about Fahesh, we talk about Yemen, we talk about <laughs> Beirut, you know. This is your sphere of influence. It shouldn't be Iran's sphere, sphere of influence. Right, that's a good, hold, hold okay. that thought. That's a good question. 
Madam, yeah, please. Barry Alam Dean. Thank you. Uh, always nice to see you, Thank Mr. You. K. Uh, two, two points. Uh, one is, what do you see Iran doing in the area after they sign the agreement, the nuclear agreement, which you think that it's going to happen rather quickly? Because already we see them almost taking over quite a few countries. Ag the second one is, is it possible that all these countries uh, gathering to defeat uh, Daesh, Fahesh, I think Fahesh is a better name for it, how come they're not succeeding? What's the, do they not want to do it, maybe? <laughs> Thank you. Connected, in a way, the two questions. Yeah, sir, how would you? Well, I'd beg to differ with you. I think Saudi Arabia has been in the lead against Fahesh. It's been in the lead in trying to get the Arab countries together to meet not just Fahesh, but the other issues. If you take the, the, the issue of Syria, for example, how it progressed since 2000, March 2011, it was Saudi and, and Gulf, Gulf uh, countries that took the lead in pushing the Arab League to take the positions that, it, that they did uh, as far as Bashar al-Assad is concerned. And moving that issue to the United Nations Security Council was under the lead of Saudi Arabia and her Gulf allies. Uh, on the military side, it was Saudi Arabia that has continued to call for support for the Free Syrian Army and provide them with the necessary means to defend the Syrian people. And we have pitched in with whatever we have and resources, whether money or, or arms, to, to help uh, the Syrians. In Iraq, equally, it was Saudi Arabia that first called for the demise of Mr. al-Maliki as, pri as prime minister. Uh, and um, fortunately, the rest of the world community finally came to the conclusion that that might be a good idea. And uh, so, the kingdom has been in, in the forefront. Um, we, we were not followers. We were leaders. So we convinced the United States of taking uh, this uh, military action that is now undertaken in Syria against Fahesh. Unfortunately, in Iraq, the Abadi government has not seen fit to ask for our support. Uh, they're much too concerned about uh, offending the Iranians. So there might be military support active rather than calling Absolutely. on if, if you were to be called Absolutely. upon. And, uh, look, uh, on Syria, for example, our foreign minister has already declared that if there is any effort to undertake boots on the ground type of operations in Syria, Saudi Arabia would be willing to, to participate in that. On your question, which was... If the negotiation yeah. is successful, just so those who can't hear, where, where will Iran go if the negotiation well, is successful? I, I wish I knew. I don't know. I, I don't have a crystal ball. But the Iranians have never shown that they're willing to reconsider their, their actions. And, and I think from that context, they will continue to press their, their advance uh, wherever they may be. Uh, and I think the, the, the agreement will give them license to do that because the lifting of the sanctions will probably make them even more confident in themselves and give them the means to, to do that. I'm going to take two questions here. I've got two questions there. Yeah, gentleman here first. Sorry, lots of hands. I'm not going to get to everyone, I'm afraid. Mohamed Al Majil, member of Chatham House and founder of Tomoh. My question to you, Your Highness, is. Sorry? A good friend. I didn't know. I'm, I'm trying not to be a favorite here. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, so you can't ask a question in that case. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Unlike historical conflicts in their region, the current conflicts are not resulting in any new states. Uh, traditionally, it's been coups or certain wars or div countries being divided. But now what's happening is more of a sumalization of the Arab world, where you have countries that are failing with no traditional borders and nothing seems to be changing. In your view, is that the new status quo or is that transitional period? Okay, collapse of states and so on. If we pass the microphone here. Yep. Uh, Alistair MacDonald Radcliffe, member of Chatham House and also engaged in interfaith dialogue, in which it was my privilege, of course, to work with Your Royal Highness and yes, Lord sir. Kerry in the World Economic Forum. If I might just press a little the point about religion, we might be very agreed that religion is not a primary uh, driver, but it has been very much used. I just wondered if that could be explored a little about the impact of the way in which religion is being used. And then the tension in between Gulf states, how that has played out. Uh, that seems to me quite a driver of some significance in Syria, and if you would like uh, to comment, Your Royal Highness, on that. And lastly, um, in regard to the Muslim Brotherhood, is there an aspect there that is primarily religious or political that makes the Muslim Brotherhood seem particularly difficult for Saudi Arabia to work with? 
Okay. When you take those two, there's a big question. Okay. The new normal of collapsing states and... Uh... Well, I hope it's transitional. Um, wherever there have been popular uprisings, historically, um, they've developed momentum and, and taken years to overcome the instability and, and the uncertainty associated with those uprisings. Um, historically, if you look back at, at Europe in the 1840s or revolutions that took place in, in Russia, for example, or in, even in Arab countries, post-colonial post, uh, revolutions in Egypt, in Iraq, in Syria, etc., etc. They've taken years to settle, so I don't think we can expect there's going to be um, a calm and, and uh, orderly uh, transition to, to stable government uh, soon. Um, in some countries, uh, they've taken steps that have been positive in that context. Lib uh, Tunis, for example, and they, they seem to be mending uh, in that effort. Uh, Egypt is trying very hard to mend. Uh, and we've just seen the, the Sharm el-Sheikh economic conference uh, in support of, of, of Egypt, where literally hundreds of, of, of uh, uh, private enterprise companies from all over the world came in to show their support for the Egyptian people and their willingness to invest in Egypt. That is an indication of where that community is looking upon Egypt as a future place for their investments. And in other places also, in Bahrain, there are, you know, this and that, but um, it, it's moving forward in there. Others are taking a more difficult uh, turn. Uh, Libya, for example, we still have civil war. We still have issues of, of killing and so on. Syria, of course, is the worst with, with the mass killings there. And Yemen, equally uh, difficult. So that's one aspect. But I hope that uh, we can overcome these, uh, these issues more on the short term rather than the long term. And, and the kingdom has been trying very hard to help in these, in these affairs. Even in, in Iraq, for example, where the kingdom has had uh, an issue with uh, the previous government, at least on, uh, on uh, sectarian, uh, sectarian issues. Um, we gave, for example, the, the, the World Relief Organization $500 million to settle Iraqi refugees. From the, from, the, from the recent um, Fahish uh, interference in, uh, in, in Iraq. So we're trying to do our best. And, and I think uh, with the help of others, maybe we can go move forward. And what was the other question? The religion, the role of ah. uh, religion in this well, Muslim Brotherhood. Is it more political or religious? The Muslim Brotherhood, my problem with the Muslim Brotherhood is, is really based on, on, on a philosophical issue. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood present themselves as a brotherhood with, with, with a leadership and, and a, 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 even a, a, an oath of loyalty uh, to the leadership that coming from a Muslim background, I can only think of one loyalty in human terms, which is to the leader of the country. And so having two oaths of, 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 of loyalty is, is disconcerting, to say the least, from my uh, personal point of view. I'm not privy to the intelligence or to the information about um, Muslim Brotherhood activities in the various countries. But this country, I think, has, has put some time now into a study on, on, on their and there's supposed to be, I think, a report coming out soon uh, about what the UK um, will decide on the issue of whether the, the Muslim Brotherhood is or is not a terrorist organization or has some criminal activities or not. Uh, as far as working with the Muslim Brotherhood, Saudi Arabia worked with the Muslim Brotherhood for 40 years. Um, and yet that did not prevent that issue of, uh, of loyalty from, from being a... Uh, uh, a thorn, if you like, in that relationship uh, between us. And, and so um, I think uh, judicial and, and government institutions are, are better qualified to give an answer to that than me, because they have all the information and not. But religion, you're right, Yanni. Religion is used politically by various groups 
uh, to further their uh, their aims, and it is to the to the alas, yani to the to the uh, effect that uh, people are being killed, uh, refugees are, are are made, and and homes and and uh, and uh, other uh, public institutions are destroyed. And the only way to get over that, I think, is to find political solutions. I'm, I'm going to bring in some last questions, and we may go a couple of minutes over time, but if I, if I may just piggyback on this question. Saudi Arabia is the guardian of the two holy sites, if I'm phrasing custodian. that correctly. So, sorry? Custodian. Custodian, thank you. Custodian. Guardian sorry, I knew I was going to use the wrong, the wrong terminology. Custodian yeah. of the two holy sites. Is there an extent to which it holds a special responsibility in trying to make sure that the literalist interpretation of Islam that is sometimes associated with Saudi Salafism yeah. is not then used by the kind of extremists that we see in IS to justify their kind of actions. Does Saudi Arabia hold a special responsibility? Are there things it can do to try to detach the use of religion for such murderous purposes? Very much so. And I think as, as in, in my answer to, to Saudi Arabia's activities in, in the Middle East, I would say that Saudi Arabia has been in the lead of, of, of countries that are very much trying to make Muslims, wherever they, they, they are from, that they feel that they are a member of the same community. Whatever, whatever uh, inclination or, or sect or, or uh, other um, uh, complexions they, they may follow. And you see that reflected in, in our programs for the pilgrimage. Yeah, the, the pilgrimage is the biggest gathering of any number of people anywhere in the world. And you know, for a period of a month, uh, you have nearly, last year I think it was, a, the numbers were about three million coming together in one place mm -hmm. and doing the same things at the same time. And when they start the pilgrimage, the, 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 the whole exercise of the pilgrimage starts on the ninth day of the month of Al Hajj. At dawn, people move from the town of Mina, that's now become a suburb of Mecca, to Arafat, which is the place where the, the Prophet, peace be upon him, gave his sermon on, on his pilgrimage to, to Mecca 1400 years ago. It's a, it's a distance of 13 kilometers, and some of them cross it by foot. Many of them take buses, and now there is a railway that takes people there. And each site has a special right to it. On the way to Arafat, they stop to pray the noon and afternoon prayers, collectively. Imagine three million people doing the prayers at the same time in one place. And then after that prayer, they go on to Arafat, where the, the sunset prayers are then held. After the sunset prayers, they start moving back the same way. And when they get to Muzdalifa, in between Arafat and Mina, again, there are special rites of prayers and the collection of the stones that they would use symbolically to uh, stone the devil when they get back to Mina. Imagine, there's three million people doing that at the same time. And they do that. And from, from Mizdalifa, they go on to, to Mina, and that's where the pilgrimage ends, by their stoning of the, of the, of the symbols of the, of the devil and the sacrifice of a lamb or a sheep or a camel, uh, and so on. And that's the pilgrimage. That's where it starts, and that's how it ends. There are three days of festivities afterwards, and then people can go home. Now, all these Muslims who are there, they come from all over the place. And they follow all the sects of Islam without any hindrance or without any opposition or any, any such interference in their practice of their religious rights. And the kingdom, publicly, in schools, in mosques, in the media, in every aspect of public life, has been carrying on this, this message that King Abdullah wanted to put at the summit back in 2012, which is that Muslims should come together, uh, Shia and Sunnah and the subdivisions uh, thereof. It's difficult. There are within Saudi society those who disagree with that. 
like there are in other societies, mm. the fringes that want to, uh, to implement and to, to promote the extremist view of, uh, of, of religion. In our courts, the four Sunni um, schools of thought are recognized as being equally legitimate, as Hanbali, Shafi'i, Hanafi, and Maliki, uh, and so on. But we have problems, and hopefully we can get over them. And the way we get over them, as I said, is through education, through the mosques, through the media, uh, social interaction, and any public utterances. Now, I did say I'd go over a couple of minutes over. I hope you're right, Your Highness, just to take a couple of minutes. I've got to take the, the hands I first, okay, the four hands I saw go up um, at the beginning, because they were here. So I have uh, the gentleman here, and then the person behind you. Sorry, I'm so not see you, sir. You, sir, there, madam, yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Ranjit yes, Gunawartner. Very pl uh, pleased to see you again in London. Thank you. May I ask where you're from? Sir? My origins are from Sri Lanka. Yes, sir. Um, We're going to be quick questions. My, though, right my question now. is very, qu very quickly is, is about Saudi Arabia and the relationship it has with emerging economies, especially Africa. Uh, I would like to know what the relationship is because at the present moment, uh, Saudi Arabia is well known for investments in Europe and also in North America. Right, if you pass back over behind you, and you had your hand up earlier, he's that gentleman with his glasses on. Okay, well, he's lost his question, that's fine. You can take it instead, <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, Walid Rastramani of Linklater's LLP, I'm a Bahraini lawyer in London. Uh, how do you see the role of regional bodies like the Arab League and the GCC? Will that role change? Should it change in light of kind of the challenges in the region? Good, and one question please about there. Uh, I'm Hiban Nasser, uh, Academy Fellow here at Chatham House. I'd like to ask, uh, what's your take about the agreement, the Gaza agreement between Jordan and Israel that's going on? Between the Gaza agreement? Between Gaza agreement be between Jordan and Israel. Between Jordan and Israel. Ah, Gaza agreement. Yes, okay. Gaza agreement. I thought you said Gaza. Gaza agreement. Uh, I thought, Jordan? My goodness. Right, okay. Gas agreement. Um, good practical questions at the end. Right, I'm sorry to all of those people who want other questions, but this is a nice, diverse kind of okay. set of questions to finish up with. Relations with Africa or investment there, gas agreement and uh, GCC. Gas agreement, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not privy to, to the details of it, but Jordan has, has diplomatic relations with Israel. They already have economic and, and other uh, relations uh, with Israel. And for the life of me, if Jordan wants gas from anywhere, they should be able to get it. <laughs> uh, and if they can't get it, let's say, from Egypt, they're, they're going to look for wherever they can, they can get it. Yani. On uh, what was the other Africa, thing? and then we finish on GCC. Africa. The kingdom is very active in Africa, um, uh, but not much publicity surrounding that. The, the, the Saudi um, Development uh, Fund um, is a big contributor to African projects uh, all along Africa, um, especially in the Sahel area, which is just below the, the, uh, the, the North African states. And if you go from, from uh, the, the, the coast of Sudan and the Red Sea all the way across through Chad, Niger, and the other countries uh, along there, Senegal, Ivory Coast, and so on, and even further south, in, in uh, Rwanda and in, in, in Central Africa and so on, you will find many projects that have been uh, funded and uh, given support by, uh, by Saudi Arabia. Uh, and we also, uh, on the other hand, receive many pilgrims from Africa. Uh, and you may be surprised to know that some of these African pilgrims actually do the pilgrimage the way they used to do it before automotive tr transport. <laughs> they come on foot yeah. and from as far away as Senegal and, 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 and Nigeria and so on, out of a sense of devotion to, to, to the uh, practice of, of, of the pilgrimage. And they're all hosted in the kingdom, of course. And trade-wise and so on, we, we do cooperate with, with African countries. And the third question was? GCC, the future of the GCC. That's a nice, easy one to finish on. Well, so. I'm looking forward to, to unity, inshallah, of, of, of the GCC. Uh, and uh, I hope that with all the crises that we are facing in the area, that uh, that would be sooner rather than, uh, than, than later. This has been the call that the kingdom put before the other GCC countries. On the Arab League, Yes, I think the Arab League needs to be more, more active. 
And uh, I know that the present uh, Secretary General of the Arab League has, has various uh, projects that he is presenting to the member states to make it a more active organization. For a period there, it was pretty active. On Syria, it was very active. On Libya, it was very active. On Yemen, it is very active. Uh, but there are structural issues that need to be fixed. And I think um, also they need more support from the states, the, the member states. Maybe they're not getting enough. Uh, enough of that. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and I've gentlemen. I've got so many people asking questions. I apologize for that. Thank you very much, Your Royal Highness. Very strong hand. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.